Testing one, two, testing one, two. You can hear me, okay. All right, today we are starting in the book of Leviticus. Uh, again, I want to uh, inform you this is a survey class, an introduction class, I suppose, to the books of the Old Testament. So we are not going deep into the theology of the book uh, as much as I would like to. This is a powerful, powerful book. Uh, and without it, neither the Old Testament nor the New Testament is complete. Uh, no, very few read it. I ask you as a class to be prepared by reading this book, but it's it's really a hard book to read. Uh, Leroy said there's 800 and how many verses? 16. 816 uh, verses in the book, and it's, it's just not one that you can get into as far as reading a story. There's not a lot of merit to uh, hear. It's mostly uh, legislation. If you could think of all the verses that you have read this week or all those that you have heard over the years from sermons or from whatever means that you might have. How many verses do you know from the book of Leviticus? I mean, what, when you think of Leviticus, what pops up is, oh, I know that verse. And when I asked myself that question, the first thing I thought of, well, I know the one about Nadab and Abihu. Uh, they were struck, stricken by fire from God because they offered strange fire. I know that one's in uh, Leviticus. And probably most of us could name some of the offerings that are described in the book of Leviticus. There's the burnt offering, the day of atonement, other festivals that are spoken of in the book, but it's just not a commonly known uh, book. And we don't read it, we skip over it. Why is that? And really, uh, the answer is, and I don't mean to disparage God's word by saying this, but it's boring. It's not a book of excitement. It's, not, it's like I said last week, like reading the telephone book. And we think of it that way because it doesn't apply uh, to us. There's no familiar stories in it. It's not in line with our culture or anything like that. It's just a bunch of laws written to a bunch of Jews that lived a long, long time ago. And so it has no application to us today. That's not true. Not That's just. Not according to Romans 15. 4. That's right. According to Romans 15, 4, all of the scriptures are what make us wise to salvation. And we need to keep that in mind when we run up on these passages. Uh, Tommy was in here a while ago saying that after you get done with Leviticus, probably the next book that you have conflict with like that is over in Second Chronicles, uh, or First Chronicles, whatever he said it was. Or just name after name after name after name. And when you read that, you think, you know, what does that have to do with me? It does. And you really need to study it to figure out what it is, but there is something there for us. And I'm not going to go into Chronicles, at least not at this point. Uh, but this here, these, the teachings, the things that come from, from Leviticus are applicable uh, to us. And they are, are things that make us wise to salvation. In fact, if we had time to go through everything that applies to our salvation, we'd be here for a long time. And I can't do that tonight because we have to move on. We've got 30 uh, six books to cover, <laughs> and I've only covered two so far in four classes. Some interesting facts about the book of Leviticus. There are more words, as you noticed in your reading this week, there are more words directly from God in the book of Leviticus than in any other book of the Bible. And God said, uh, you know, a lot of times you have Jeremiah writing or Isaiah writing, and they'll quote from God or say, God said this, but uh, you know, in Genesis, there, there's God said this, but for the most part, it's narrative, and it's not actually God voicing the words. In Leviticus, it's actually God voicing the words, speaking face to face with Moses. When Jesus stood in the synagogue in Nazareth, and they asked him to uh, read from the scriptures, he read from the book of Leviticus, and he says in Leviticus, or from Leviticus, uh, well, in Luke 4, verse 21, he says, today this scripture is fulfilled uh, in your hearing. He was talking about the fact that uh, the year of Jubilee, uh, I think it was, that he was, he was speaking of, the year of the Lord when uh, all the captives will be set free. This day, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. It came from Leviticus. 
In Leviticus 25, an interesting fact, Jews were not allowed to charge interest to other Jews. Now, if you're living in today's economy, economy-driven society, you think, well, I don't know about that. But listen to what it says. If one of your brethren becomes poor and falls, Leviticus 25, verse 35, if one of your brethren becomes poor and falls into poverty among you, then you shall help him like a stranger or a sojourner that he may live with you. Take no usury or interest from him, but fear your God that your brother may live with you. You shall not lend him your money for usury, nor lend him your food at a profit. What's he say? Well, you treat this guy, he says, like a stranger or a sojourner, but I think it's more than that. You treat him as a family member. When you give your family food, you don't say, well, uh, I'm giving you food, but you owe me this much for, for, for that hamburger I, I gave you. Or when you lend someone uh, uh, money, lend your money, family money, you try to, you know, you don't get, lend it to them, you, you give it to them. He says, you do the same thing with the poor. Uh, and I, that, again, it may be strange for our economy, but I think it's fundamental to, or it says something very fundamental to, about God's regard for the poor, not just among the Jews, but in the world. Uh, he has a thing, if you want to call it that, for the poor. If we live by this standard, the poor man would be treated as a family member, not as somebody who is uh, not worthy of our attention. We are our brother's keeper. We are our brother's keeper. That's exactly right. And you know, there are some people who, uh, you know, some of the homeless, and I don't mean to say this about all the homeless, but some of the people who are homeless are homeless because of the choices they make. They, they homeless, uh, I talked to a fellow out in Denver one time. He was, uh, he worked for, car company, a car rental company, and uh, I was renting from that particular uh, place, and I, I said, I noticed you got a lot of homelessness around here. It was, it was downtown in Denver. <coughs> and he said, you know, homelessness is their drug of choice. I mean, they, they choose to be homeless because they need the money that they would use to, for shelter to pay for drugs. Well, I don't think that's true of all homeless people, but there are some people who that's what they, the, the choices they have made, and you can't help them, at least not by giving them money, that only makes it worse for them. Uh, but over the last 3,500 years since God made this law for the Jews, things haven't changed. God uh, has a regard for the poor. Uh, and we need to be, be attentive to that. And it comes from the book of Leviticus. Another interesting fact is that Leviticus, uh, while it lists 600 plus laws from God, very seldom does God say, you do this because he just says you do this. There's very little explanation. Now, there is some, and there is throughout the Bible you'll find God explaining it himself, but that's not very often. It's more the case, typically the case, you do this because, in the way my daddy said it, because daddy said so. Daddy, I told you to, you do it for that reason. And the idea is that we should trust God to do what he says without having to know why. It may be a curiosity to us. We may want to know why, but I do it anyway without having to know why because I trust where God is leading me or I trust what God is doing. And I think we, this is one of the things that God is trying to get across in the book, book Levitic, of Leviticus. Trust me. Remember who he's speaking to. People who just came out of Egypt after being in Egypt for 400 years. They weren't slaves all that time, but they were in Egypt for 400 years. And they had learned to trust that culture, that Pharaoh, those gods and so forth. And God says, I need you to trust me. Even if it goes against all of your teaching, all of your learning, if I tell you to do something, if I tell you to march around the city of Jericho 13 times in seven days, you do it, even though it doesn't make sense. Well, that's not in Leviticus, but he's training them in Leviticus to do that very thing in Jericho 40 years later. If we obey only because we understand, then we're not really obedient. We're simply deciding to agree with God because he agrees with us or he, it suits us. Sometimes uh, God tells us to do something and it doesn't make any sense and we just do it because I said so, not me, but God says so. And then we find that in the book of Leviticus. You know that in Leviticus, uh, we find part of the Christmas story. In um, Leviticus chapter 12, it 
it says, the Lord spoke to Moses and say, saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, if a woman has conceived and born a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days and in the seven day, in the days of her customary impurity, she shall be unclean. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. She shall then continue in blood of her, in the blood of her pure, purification for 33 days. She shall not touch any hallowed thing nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purification are fair, uh, fulfilled. But if she bear a female child, then she shall be unclean two weeks and in her, in, and as in her customary impurity, and she shall continue in blood, in the blood of her purification 66 days. When the days of her purification are fulfilled, whether for son or for daughter, she shall bring the priest a lamb for the, for the first year as a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove as a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. We find Mary doing that very thing after the birth of Jesus when she came <clears throat> to uh, the temple and where she met Simon or Simeon and Anna. So she came offering her sacrifice of purification, those turtle doves that she that are mentioned in the books of Matthew uh, and, and Luke. Are you familiar with the term Corban? C-O-R-B-A-N. It's a New Testament, in the New Testament times, it's not a New Testament doctrine, but by the time of the New Testament, the Pharisees, or at least some of them, some of the radical, very, um, Radical, I guess, is the word to say it. They, they weren't pious Jews as far as following the law. They were pious Pharisees. They, they were more concerned about their Phariseeism than they were about following God's law. But anyway, some of them had gotten to the point that they were not taking care of their aging parents. One of the Ten Commandments says, make sure you take care of your, honor your father and mother. But the Pharisees, rather than using the money that they so loved, seems, at least some of the Pharisees, they found a loophole. And they called this loophole Corban. Let me read to you a text in Mark chapter 7, uh, verse 5. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, say, ask him, why do your disciples walk not accord, or not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? And Jesus answered and said to them, well, or well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honor me with their uh, lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they teach or worship me, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men, for they lay aside the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers, cups, and many other things, such as you do. In verse 9 he says, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you can keep your tradition. Moses said, for example, Honor your father and mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a, man, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, that is a gift to God, then you no longer have to do anything for your father and mother, making the word of God of no effect in your tradition which you have handed down. There's no teaching in the Bible about using Corban or this doctrine they called Corban, this loophole, to take away their responsibility to take care of their parents. But they said, well, because I have made an offering to God of this money, it's dedicated to God. I have a, it's not in the treasury, but I have said that I'm going to give this to God. I can't use it to help you, Dad, so I'm sorry you're going to stay on the street tonight. That's the idea. They kept their money and did not take care of their parents, and they used this loophole, which they developed. It's not in God's law. Well, I brought that up because the word korban is a Hebrew word, actually, and it means offering, and it's used 36 times in the book of Leviticus. So what verse does that mean? In Mark, I read all the way from chapter uh, 7, verse 5, down through verse 13. The word korban is found in verse 11. I wanted to get the whole context so you could see the argument between Jesus, he said, and the Pharisees. They accused him of not washing his hands, and it's not talking about dirty hands, it's, not, it's talking about unclean hands, not ceremonially clean, but washing in the right way. And he says, you know, you guys are, you're always doing this. You're making laws where God didn't make laws, and you're changing God's laws to be different than they were. And then he gave them an example. You know, God told you to take care of your parents, and here you say, no, I don't have to because Corban. I'm sorry? 
Because I'm a gift. Yeah. <laughs> and so he, uh, uh, Jesus. I'm a gift to them. That's right. And Jesus, the reason I brought that up is because this word korban is a Hebrew word and it comes from the book of Leviticus used 36 different times. In your assigned textbook from uh, the college press that I gave you, Smith says on page 218 that there are five major offerings described in Leviticus. Quoting from Smith, he says, at the risk of extreme oversimplification, we will summarize the topology and significance of the sacrifices. Number one, burnt offering, the death of Christ for our sins. That's the significance, he says, uh, of the typology. That should be type typology, not topology. I wrote this misspoke. Uh, the typology and the significance of the sacrifice, the type and significance of the burnt offering is that it is the death of Christ for our sins. I would go so far as to say uh, the burnt offering is not only the death of Christ for our sins, but his whole total giving of his life to God. He, he didn't have a secular attitude toward his life. Saturday's yours, God, but you know Friday's mine. He didn't have that attitude. He gave his complete life to God and I believe Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says we are to do the same. We, our life is to be a burnt offering to God. Anyway, uh, a meal offering is also found in the book of Levit Leviticus. Its typology or significance is our gift of ourselves in accompaniment with Christ as a gift of himself. Peace offering, expressions of joy and peace and salvation. Sin offering, sacrifices for sins done ignorantly. Trespass offering, sacrifices for sins done uh, knowingly. And we'll see some significance of those as we uh, go on. Those are the five major offerings that it starts out with. Uh, the trespass offering and the sin offering are oftentimes combined, but they are two different offerings. Uh, one is for something you did ignorantly. One is for something you did knowingly. Some people say that there are no sacrifices in Old or New Testament, even including Christ, for a presumptuous sin. And I would agree with that to an extent, but if I did a presumptuous sin when I was 30, and at 60 I came to know the Lord uh, and regretted that decision, I think there is sacrifice for my sin. Christ's sacrifice is good for my sin, but I, I've heard it said that if you are, are ever guilty of presumptuous sin, then there is no forgiveness for you, especially if you are a Christian. I struggle with that uh, theology. Uh, I, I agree with the sentiment, uh, but you know, if a guy is truly penitent uh, of something that he did, even presumptuously, uh, God does have something to say about presumptuous sin, but if in time I realize, you no, know, that was just truly, truly wrong. I had a, uh, my mind is changed, my person is changed, uh, then I think, uh, like Paul, when he was imprisoning the disciples or the, the followers of Christ, that wasn't presumptuous. No, that wasn't. That he, did was it. A, he did it because he thought that was the right thing. To do. He, he says, I did it in all good conscience. That's and that's right. a pretty strong argument there for that, uh, for what people say that if you did it presumptuously and, and it violated your conscience, then you can receive no forgiveness for that. You know, there, I understand the sentiment, yeah. but if in time my mind is changed by my uh, devotion to God's word, by my giving myself to God, I can overcome that presumptuous attitude that I had, and I think I can be forgiven for that. Uh, I think Judas could have been forgiven. His sin was presumptuous, but he did not give it time to uh, allow that. Peter's sin, I don't know that it was presumptuous. He didn't plan to do this and say, I'm going to deny Christ. Uh, so it wouldn't have been a presumptuous sin. Judas was presumptuous. And he was not, from what I can understand, uh, forgiven. Not because uh, it was a presumptuous sin, but because he never repented of it, truly. He never changed who he was on it. But that's for the Lord to take care of, not for me. Remember when you were a kid? playing sandlot baseball on baseball at school or whatever, getting up a, a team, you, you choose uh, captains or someone would be designated as captains and the captains would pick from the crowd who would be on his or her team. Well, how did that work out for you? 
you were chosen, it was good. If you were chosen, it was uh, good. The biggest, the fastest, the strongest, the most popular. These were the people who would probably be the team captains, and then they would in turn choose the other biggest, fastest, and most popular people to be on the team. Sometimes they weren't even good. They just were their best friends, so they chose them. But uh, assuming that the captain wanted to win, he's going to choose the biggest, the fastest, and the uh, strongest ones. And if you're chosen, that feels pretty good. You know, you feel pretty, I get to play on the team today. But if you're not chosen or you're one of the last yeah, ones chosen right. because they don't, really want me. they don't want me and they just choose me because I'm here and they need that ninth player and all that, and it doesn't make you feel uh, very good. We all have a desire to be needed, a desire to be wanted. But on the other side of that coin, if you are chosen, if you are one of those who are desired or needed on the team, for example, it puts you in a position where you have to perform. Um, if you are the one you're chosen because of your speed or your dexterity or your, your agility, your, your sportsmanship or whatever, when you are chosen, you have to perform up to that reputation that you had the first people chosen are supposed to be good better than most and so when you're out there on the field if you are one of the ones chosen and you missed the ball that easy to catch then hmm, i'm not so sure i want him on my team uh next time the bigger team that has the better reputation if, uh, if alabama for example gets out on the football field and just makes a fool of themselves they don't get over it very easily from their fans whereas another team who is customarily not very well, nobody holds them to that same kind of standard. If you're chosen, if you're among the big ones, if you've got the big reputation, if you're among the elite, then you have greater demands placed upon you. It feels good to be chosen. It feels good to be among that elite, but it comes with responsibilities. Think about the Israelites in the book of Leviticus, Exodus and Leviticus. They were the ones chosen by God. When Moses stood before them and spoke the words that we have in the book of Leviticus, they were thinking, they had to have been thinking, you know, we are the ones chosen by God. In the book of Exodus, we see that God chose them to be his people. He brought them out of Exodus, or Egypt, gathered them around Mount Sinai, and, and then came down to, to be among them. He, he selected them. He Selected them among all the nations of the world. He told them this. I've selected you among all these people. You are to be my people. And he volunteered, I will be your God. Think about the privilege that these people of uh, Israel must have, or they did have and must have felt. Maybe they got a little proud because you no know, God has, this guy has chosen us. They don't know God that well yet because they've not had that much experience with him, but they've had enough to see, you know, he's a pretty serious guy. He defeated the Egyptian army. He's brought us from the Red Sea to Mount Sinai, I think a three months journey where he provided for them over and over again. And he now says, I have chosen you to be my people. I can't imagine that their hearts were not filled with joy. But then you have the other side of that coin. Along with being chosen by God becomes the requirement, comes the requirements of being chosen by God, living with God. With the privilege of knowing the Holy God comes the necessity of being a holy people. And that's what the book of Leviticus is about, teaching them how to be that holy people. The God of righteousness, the God of perfection needs, or his people, those whom he has chosen, must be that kind of people. He needs a perfect people. Uh, or needs, needs the people to be perfect in order to be in that relationship with him. And that's a problem for all of humanity except one that I know of, and that being Jesus Christ. So when it comes to being chosen by this God, there's good news. You know, we, uh, we've been chosen by God, and then there's the what have we gotten ourselves into 
uh, news. Exodus provides us the good news. Listen to him. Exodus chapter 6, verse 7. I will take you as my people. I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I am Yahweh, your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a heritage. I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. Can't you imagine there in that crowd, them shouting and cheering and excitement with joy? We've been chosen by God. We're finally getting to go to the promised land that we heard from our great, great, great grand grandfathers. I can imagine that this was just a wonderful event. This nation of slaves now chosen by God. We are on God's team. God is now our God. But watch Leviticus show us the other side of the coin. Leviticus 22, verse 31. Therefore, you shall keep my commandments and perform them. I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. Verse 32. You shall not profane my holy name, but I will, hallow, I, I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. Why? I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Verse 33. Uh, I brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. So he's clarifying to him. I'm, if you're going to be my people, you need to recognize who I am and be that kind of people. This book outlines in graphic detail what God expected of these people. And if they're going to play on his team, they're going to have to be or abide by certain rules. With the privilege of being God's people came the responsibility of being God's people. The deeper we go into the Old Testament, the more we'll come to an understanding that God is, is different from us, from, from humans. He's more powerful than we are. He knows more than we do. But the thing that strikes me most about this God is his incredible purity and holiness as is depicted in the book of Leviticus. It shows that we are flawed humans and he is perfection personified. We are full of sin. He has not one jot or tittle of sin. We have a tendency to excuse our wrongs. He hates wrong with a divine passion. There's a difference between man and God, and God is calling us to become like him. He's not going to become like us. He can't. It's against his nature, but he's calling us to be like him. He's calling these children of Israel to be like him. And as we read the book of Leviticus, I'm, I'm impressed with the, the emphasis, emphasis on this holiness, this concept of holiness. The word holy is mentioned 87 times in the book of Leviticus, more than any other book of God. And God stresses his essential holiness in the book throughout. He says we are uh, taught that holiness is the primary character or quality of the character of God. God is holy. I am holy. He's just, he's merciful, he's graceful, he's all that. But first and foremost, I am a holy God. And his people have to be a holy people. The book of Leviticus tells us that even his name is holy. Don't use my name in an empty or vain way or worthless way. My name is holy. It's sacred. Moses shows us in Leviticus that the place where God lives is holy. The priest who serve him must be holy. Whatever is dedicated to God for use in God's service must be holy or, or made holy. It follows then that God's people must be holy. Let's look at it. Leviticus chapter 11 verse 44. For I am the Lord your God, you shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth, for I am the Lord and uh, who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Skip down to chapter 19, verse 1. He says, And the Lord spake to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. In the next chapter, chapter 20, verse 7, 
Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God, and you shall keep my statutes, you shall perform them. I am the Lord your God who uh, sanctifies you. Verse 26, the same chapter. And you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from peoples, from the peoples or from the nations that you should be mine. In Leviticus 23, verse 31, Therefore you shall keep my commandments and perform them. I am the Lord. You shall not profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Over and over, I am holy. I am holy. I am holy. You are mine. You must be holy. That's the theme or part of the theme of the book of Leviticus. Now, if you really want to open your eyes to that, read what Peter wrote, not to Jews during the time of Moses, but to those of us who are here today, as well as those in Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia that he wrote to. Listen to it. First Peter chapter 1, verse 14. As obedient children, or children of obedience, children who come from obedience, do not conform yourselves or be conformed to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. You were different then. Now you are children of obedience. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it's written, be holy, for I am holy. In chapter 2, he says, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a what? A holy nation, a people belonging to God. Once you were not a people, now you are the people of God. We're not just talking about Jews anymore. We're talking about you and I, and we have this responsibility. We have been chosen by God, a holy God, and we have this responsibility, therefore, to be a holy people. And that's really what Peter uh, is all about, is teaching them have their responsibility to be holy people. But going back to Leviticus, not only is there an emphasis on holy, and this is may sound the same, but it's a little bit different. There's emphasis on perfection. Anything dedicated to God has to be without defect. Sacrificial animals had to be perfect. In fact, according to Jewish uh, tradition and writings, the oral traditions and writings of the Jews, they would cut that animal in half and literally investigate the internal organs of that animal to see if it was absolutely without spot and blemish. Not only was it not able to be a lame animal or have some visible uh, imperfection on the outside, they would cut him open and make sure that there was no imperfection as far as they could tell on the inside. So they needed to be, sacrificial animals had to be perfect. The animals given as a, a tithe had to be perfect. The priests who served God in the tabernacle were required to be without defect. Bl blindness, lameness, having a wart. Uh, you couldn't be a priest uh, serving in the tabernacle even if you were from the line of Aaron. Without defect is a uh, in, in the physical realm, I think, symbolizes God's requirement that we have to be spiritually without defect. And you think about what that means. If I have to be spiritually without defect, I can't make it because I'm not spiritually pure. I have sin. I do have, as we say today, issues that are unresolved as yet. So how can I be a Christian? How can I be in relationship with God? It's the effort you put forth. It is an effort that we put forth, uh, but we're going to talk about that more in a moment. I just want you to think about that question. If they had to be spiritual or had to be without defect or else they could not serve in the tabernacle, what is the implication for us uh, to get today? The idea is that is being presented as God takes perfection seriously. He wants his people to take it seriously, but he takes it seriously. I don't want, any, I can't be in association with, in communion with that which is imperfect. We can't allow ourselves today, as we oftentimes are tending, we tend to do, to uh, accept our little sins, 
because well, I do so much. I go to church on Sunday. I have served as a deacon for 15 years and I help little old ladies across the street. I do so much. Uh, I think God's going to give me a pass on you name the sin that we want to keep in our back pocket where nobody sees. God requires perfection. Uh, he can't, uh, it's not that he doesn't, but he, he doesn't, but it's not just that he doesn't. He, he can't give us a pass on things that we, well, it's okay. You did so good over here. You, you, you can, you know, teachers do that. You, know, you, you did so good in math. I'm going to give you a pass on this bad English grade that you got. You know, it, it's, it's not, uh, God can't do that. That's There's an emphasis. I'm sorry. That's why he looks in our heart. That's right. He does look and he wants to write his will upon our heart in this new covenant. There's an emphasis on holiness. There's an emphasis on perfection. There's an emphasis on cleanness. The word clean or unclean used some 200 times in the book of Leviticus. In chapter 10, in verse 8, the record says, Then the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink. Nor you nor your sons with you when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that you may distinguish between holy and unholy, between unclean and clean, and that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord uh, has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. So the priest had to be able to discern between clean and unclean to teach Israel to do the same. So he said, God says, no alcohol for you when you go into the uh, tabernacle of meeting. Alcohol will blur those distinctions, apparently. And God says, no, you, you can't do that. But the purpose is so that you can properly discern between clean and unclean. And Leviticus is really a, a handbook on what you might call clean living. There were clean and unclean animals. There was clean and unclean uh, foods. There was clean and unclean sicknesses. There were clean and unclean objects and people and relationships. So God is, makes an emphasis upon what this clean and unclean. And we mentioned earlier about one of the most known verses or uh, passages in the book of Leviticus is there in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1, where Nadab and Abihu were stricken dead. Listen to what it says. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer, put fire on it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire. That's another word for profane? Unclean fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord to devour them and died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by who those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. Don't bring me something profane, whether it's fire, your life, your animal, don't bring me something profane. And so made that with my word made an illustration by God. I will not accept it. I will not tolerate it. It cannot be. They offered profane, or I think King James says, uh, strange uh, fire, strange worship. So the sin was what they offered. It was not, uh, in the context of, of Leviticus, clean. Uh, we could go into a lot of detail in uh, history, or not history, but context to see exactly why this took place and why that fire wasn't clean, but it's not our purpose to do that tonight. The, but the, the punishment for them offering that profane or unclean or strange fire was God struck them dead immediately. I will be hallowed, he says. Do not bring me something profane. Leviticus shows us very clearly that a holy God must have a holy people. A uh, perfect God must have a perfect people. A clean God must have a clean people. So with the privilege of being chosen, these Israelites, they had the responsibility of living according to that standard. They were an exclusive group chosen by God, but they had to live up to that calling. Uh, 
we are, according to the, the Greek word translated church, the ecclesia, the ones called out, the ones chosen by God. We have that same privilege and high calling, and we have the same responsibility then to live up to that calling. If that were the only picture of God in the Old Testament or in the book of Leviticus, what a terrible picture. Because none of them were perfectly clean. None of them were perfectly uh, holy. None of them were perfectly perfect. They all had flaws. Uh, so if that's the only picture of God that we get from Leviticus, we would live in fear of God, not because we revere him, but because we shake in our boots because of him. And that's not what God wants, never has been what God wants. He does want us to reference him, to fear him, but because of who we know he is in, in love. And I think that's what the Bible teaches. And knowing that he said what he meant, meant what he said. You know? That's right. We also see here in the book of Leviticus, a merciful God. And if we didn't have this picture of mercy, the book of Leviticus would be a horrible, horrible book. But there is not only the picture of his holiness, there is the picture of his mercy because these people, just like us, are not capable of living according, absolutely according to that holy standard. If the only thing that we get from the book of Leviticus is uh, fear of his wrath because we can't meet his holiness, then we leave this book inadequate, inferior, quite depressed. We're, you know, we, we have no hope. But there is something more to the book that we need to see. And I think one author put it, and I think in a very good way, the God of Leviticus is the God of second chances. And I think that accurately captures, and we'll, we'll see that. God requires perfection for a relationship, but no man can do that. None of us has been perfect, as you mentioned from the book of Romans. While ago, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None have not done so. And God is not unaware of the fact of how difficult it is for us to, to live in the flesh, facing the temptations of Satan, knowing that we have been given the opportunity to choose him, but facing the temptations of Satan, it, you know, we often fall, and God knows that. Listen to what Paul or David says in the Psalms. <clears throat> I love this passage. If I could quote, commit it to memory, I would, but I'm, I'm not smart enough to commit this many verses to memory. Psalm 103. It's a song. We're not going to read all of it, but we're going to read a good portion of it. Imagine when you read the Psalms, someone singing. That's what's going on here. They're singing these words. And we, the first words there we have made into a song. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Then you get in verse 2. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, mercies, who sanctifies your mouth with good, or satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and judges justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his way to Moses. His acts are known to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful. The Lord is gracious. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us nor keep his anger uh, forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. What does that mean? We deserve worse than what we're getting nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his what? His mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions. I love that passage. How far is the east from the west? Well, there's just 
<laughs> it's a long way. I mean, it just, it's an infinity out there. And that's how far God has removed our transgressions. Why? He is a merciful God. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. And here's the verse I'm looking for. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Thank you, God, for remembering that I am but dust. I'm not God. I don't have your capabilities. And God says, I know that. I understand, Mike. I understand who you are. Our God is a merciful God. And the book of Leviticus, like this psalm, helps us understand or see God as someone bending over backward to extend that mercy, to make up for our unholiness, our imperfections, our uncleanness, our failures. God states the ideal situation, be holy for I am holy. But then he makes, I won't say an allowance. He, in the book of Leviticus, he Well, I don't know how to express it outside of that word of allowance. It's not like he allows us to sin, but he makes it possible for us to be cleaned from that sin. Uh, he, we have the picture of holiness, but we also have a picture of mercy. I know you can't meet that, so here's what I'll do, or here's what I've done. And he did. Uh, the ideal is holy. The reality is... I'm not. I'm not holy. I have sinned. Uh, Leviticus tells us how God takes an unholy people and makes them to be holy. And we need to see this because we have sinned. We have, like they, fallen short of the glory of God. We cannot stand in his presence as we are. So whatever it was they needed, we need it too. Whatever God extended to them to make them holy, because they weren't, even after he called them to be his people, they often sinned. Even Moses and Aaron and Miriam, the uh, chosen leaders of God, they, they sinned, but they somehow remained in fellowship with God because of some mercy he extended to them. And the book of, of Leviticus is not only, I am holy, you be holy, but it's also, let me show you how we can clean you up because you are unholy. We see God's cleanness and requirement of cleanness and the people's need of being purified. So again, the requirement is to be clean. That's the idea, but the reality was they were not. They needed purification. And in this wonderful, wonderful book of Leviticus, we see this high standard of God and we see that God has, by in mercy, provided a means whereby we can meet that standard. And I hope you got that from the book of Leviticus. And all those offerings that you uh, read or read about, and all those rituals and all those laws and details that they had to comply with in order to make those offerings, why was that? It's God offering mercy and keeping his standard of holiness. Uh, God didn't say, well, you can't do it, so here, let me come down to your level. He did not do that in Leviticus. He does not do that in the New Testament. He brings them up to uh, his level. God is merciful, not tolerant, and we don't need to confuse those two terms. There's a big difference between merciful and tolerant. God is merciful to forgive our sins so that we can be purified only when we decide to turn away from those sins. Um, I can't give you an example uh, necessarily, a, fit, a literal example from the scriptures or from the book of Leviticus, but uh, if a person came to God to offer a burnt offering, but he in his heart still uh, wanted to be involved in that sin, let's say he's guilty of adultery, he's living with somebody else's wife or sleeping with somebody else's wife, and he comes and bring a, brings a burnt offering, it's no good. 
and God would tell us that not so much in the book of Leviticus, but in the later prophets, he would say, you guys misunderstand. You know, just because you perform this ritual that I told you about doesn't mean you have forgiveness. If your heart is still in the sin, so are you, no matter how many cows you, you bring. So God is merciful, but he doesn't play with sin. It's not a game for him. Sin is uh, uh, and a, an a curse to God. or a, it's, it's, it's something that just literally makes God sick. He cannot be tolerant of our sins if we will not repent. I think it's because of God's mercy that there is a sacrificial system. And it's pointed out here in the book of Leviticus animals being sacrificed, blood flowing around the altar, ceremonies and, and sacrifice uh, re regulations throughout the book of Leviticus. It's all because God is merciful. The entire sacrificial system is a, a and again, I, I use the word allowance for lack of better words, for the fact that people could not be holy and could not be clean and could not be perfect by themselves. So here, let me do something to make that possible. And that is, in the Old Testament, the sacrificial system that we see here in the book of Leviticus. It's God's way of making imperfect people perfect. Uh, there are all kinds of sacrifices. There were the day-to-day -day sacrifices. Uh, for example, the sin offering. You, make a, or you commit a sin, you make a confession, a, the animal is sacrificed, the blood is poured out at the base of the altar, it's rubbed on the horns of the altar, the fat is burned on the altar, the meat is, uh, depending upon the sacrifice, later eaten by the priest. And in chapter 4, verse 31, it says, in this way the priest will make atonement for the sinner. He will be forgiven. There's the guilt uh, or trespass offering accomplished much in the same manner as, as the, the sin offering. There was the, on the Day of Atonement, once a year, the, the sins of the entire community were brought before God and forgiven through this means. The high priest would sacrifice a young bull for his own sin. He would then sprinkle that blood upon the uh, most holy place or in the most holy place, the Ark of the Covenant, for his own sins. And then he would go back out and he would sacrifice a goat or a lamb for the sins of the people following the same procedure. He would take some of the blood and, and sprinkle it upon, or maybe use a hyssop brush and sprinkle it upon the, uh, the most holy place, the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. And then he would take, according to Leviticus, he would take another goat and you're familiar with this term, a scapegoat. We still use that term today, not in the same context, but he would take a, another goat and he would confess over it all the sins of the people. He's, imagine him leaning upon that animal and praying to God, saying, we have sinned, and confessing his, not just his, but their sins, placing, transferring the sins in a symbolic way from them, God doing this through the priest, transferring their sins to that goat. And then what happened to the goat, the scapegoat? Anybody remember? He was killed outside the camp. He wasn't killed. He was sent outside the camp. He probably was killed uh, by some Jews that were stationed out there. According to tradition, that's what they did. They'd have some people outside the camp uh, out in the desert who would, when they saw, they would tie a rope or ribbon or something around the goat so that they would know who it was or which one it was. And when they saw it, they would kill it so that he wouldn't go back in the city. Now there was no law for that. That's just something they, maybe they had a few of them come back in the city and they said, well, we can't have that because this is the goat filled with sin. So they developed a tradition of killing the goat out in the desert, but he would be sent out in the desert. He would be alone. He would be without the camp. He is the scape. Do you see any significance in the book of Leviticus or from the New Testament in the book of Leviticus? Any uh, thing that uh, sounds familiar, I suppose. Well, it is Christ taking upon himself our sins. That's exactly right. There's a whole slew of typologies fulfilled or prophecies uh, fulfilled in, in, 
you can't call the typology is really a kind of prophecy. Jesus, for example, is our high priest. And the Old Testament priest, remember, he would have to kill a bull and take that blood, <coughs> some of that blood, he would do other things with it, but he would take some of that blood and he would sprinkle it on the uh, Ark of the Covenant for his own sin. And then he would go and kill a lamb or a goat for the sins of the people. Well, Jesus did not have to uh, make a sacrifice for his own sins. And the book of Levit uh, Hebrews makes that clear. Really, if you don't know the book of Leviticus, you really can't understand what's taking place in the book of Hebrews. But the book of Hebrews says that he offered uh, uh, only one sacrifice. He only went into the holy place one time because he didn't have to go twice. He didn't have to offer sacrifice for his own sins. So there's a similarity in the high priesthood, except there's a difference. The human high priest or the Aaronic high priest, he had to offer sins for himself. Jesus did uh, not. He had no sins to, to confess or to uh, be atoned for. But not only is Jesus our high priest, he is our sacrificial lamb. The, the lamb of the Old Testament was uh, killed in place of the people. The people should have died. It was because they had sinned, they should have died. That's the law. That's the law from the very beginning, from uh, the time of uh, Adam and Eve. So because of their sins, they should have died, but God made, mercifully made this sacrificial system so that the lamb would die in their place. This one lamb who was innocent, he did nothing, but their guilt was transferred to him and he paid the penalty. And that's exactly, as you mentioned what ago, Leroy, what Jesus did for us. We were guilty, he paid the penalty. So when we speak of the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, when John speaks of that in John chapter one, he's talking about this very thing that he is the one, he's innocent, but he's come here to take our penalty, to take away the sin of the world. That's mercy. I mean, that shows that there is justice. Death must take place, but the justice is satisfied in that Jesus mercifully became that sacrifice. That he took our place. He's the sacrificial animal. He's the high priest, but he's also our scapegoat. He took upon himself the sins of the whole world, past, present, and future, and he was put outside the camp. Remember, Jesus died, not in Jerusalem, but outside of Jerusalem. There's a reason for that. Uh, he died alone. He died deserted. Remember what he cried from the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a powerful passage to understand. But Jesus is proclaiming that he has been... Uh, because he has taken on the sin of the world, he is, he's not guilty, but he's seen as guilty. He has become the sin offering. The sin separates from God. It separates from God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your back on me? And that's a powerful passage. Powerful. The purpose of all this ceremony in Leviticus was so that God could give his people a, a second chance. They were unholy. He required holiness. He required perfection. And they could not do it by themselves. So he said, here, let me do this. And he establishes this, everything you read about in the book of Leviticus, this, this sacrificial system. So what man could not accomplish for himself, God accomplished for him. And it's no different today. God's lamb died to pay our penalty to make us something that we could not make ourselves. You're not made holy because you go to church three times a week. That's right. You're not made holy because you memorize so many scriptures in the Bible. You're not made holy because you help little old ladies across the street. You're made holy by the death of Jesus Christ, by the sacrif merciful sacrificial system that God set up in the New Testament, of which the Old Testament is just a picture, a shadow. But God is more than just a God of second chance. Now, I wanted to I know our time is up. For, well, it's, it's up for the first hour, but I want to say this. I want you to see this picture. You can't leave the book of Leviticus without seeing this picture. He's more than just a God of the second chance. We'll call him the God of the soft touch. He's a soft touch. 
And I want to show that to you. Look with me in Leviticus chapter 5. Beginning in verse 5. Not only does God go the second mile, God goes a second thousand miles with us. Listen to it. And it shall be when he is guilty of any of these matters that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing and that he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord for his sin which he has committed, a female lamb, uh, a female from the flock, a lamb, a kid, uh, the goats, as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for him concerning his sin. So a female lamb, if I have sinned as a trespass offering to receive God's mercy, I must offer this female lamb. But what if I come to God and I say, Lord, I, I understand that I'm worthy of death and you're holy and glorious and I, I cannot meet your standard by, by my doings. I have to offer this lamb, but I have no money. My farm failed. I, I don't have a lamb. I don't have the money to procure a lamb. Must I die in sin because I don't have this ability? Leviticus chapter 5, verse 7. If he is not able to bring a lamb, then he shall bring to the Lord for his trespass, which he has committed two turtle doves to young pigeons, one a sin offering, the other a burnt offering. And he shall bring them to the priest who has offered who shall offer that which is for a sin offering first and wring off its head from its neck and shall not be divided. But so the priest, it says, shall uh, make atonement, verse 10, for him on behalf of the sin which he has committed that it shall be forgiven. If you can't afford lamb, that's okay. I'm a soft touch. Bring me two turtle doves. Yeah. Oh Lord, forgive my impudence. I cannot afford a lamb. I don't even have six pence with which to buy a, a turtle dove. How can I be sheltered from your wrath, from your just anger, because I have no means? Verse 11. But if he is not able to bring two turtle doves or young pigeons, then he who sins shall bring for his offering one-tenth of an effort of fine flour as a sin offering. Can't afford a lamb? It's okay. I understand. You can't afford two turtle doves? I get it. I understand. Bring me a handful of flour. Can you do that? Who can afford a handful of flour? You can go out in your, and, and you know, they didn't have mega crops like we have today where you can walk out in the field and see thousands of acres of grain. They probably had a little spot about as big as that table full of grain by which they could make, uh, or full of whatever wheat that they could make some flour. So can you go out and even in the corners of somebody's field, if you're that poor, you can find it for free. God made it that way. Gather a handful of grain, grind it up and bring me some flour. Can you do that? And by that means, verse 13 says, the priest shall make atonement for the other, for the sin that he's committed. Can't afford a lamb, bring me a dove. Can't afford a dove, bring me a handful of flour. The point is, God wants nothing to separate us from him. He wants no sin to be between us and him. And he says, I've established this sacrificial system so that you can be forgiven. And now in the New Testament, what does God do? You know, the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. All that from the Old Testament that was, I'm telling you, or God is telling us, that was a picture of what I'm going to do. You can't bring me enough. There's nothing you can bring. A bull, a lamb, an ox. There's nothing you can bring that will take away. I'll bring you my lamb. The God of a soft touch. Praise God we have one. All right. We'll stop there and jump into the book of uh, Numbers when we get back. Let's take a break. Vincent, we're going to take a break. Okay. okay. And we'll come back in uh, five or ten minutes and we'll jump into the book of uh, numbers. All righty. I'm just going to leave the recording going. Yes, sir.
tell you, even that discussion though was helpful, even after having read the book of Leviticus. I mean, it, it just brings it out better. I'm glad it was helpful. Yeah, it was very helpful. I had a glass of water somewhere. There it is. Let's see, is tomorrow September 1st or Friday or Saturday September 1st? Uh, Saturday, yeah. Saturday. Sunday's, on, Sunday's the second. Hello, Seth. Well, I see your picture, but I don't see you, hear you. I see you there anyway. All right, in order to get this class done, we're going to go ahead and start. I assume everybody's been back. If you're not back, I will send you the recording and you'll be able to catch up. <clears throat> Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and then what? Numbers. Numbers. What is, I asked this about Leviticus, what about Numbers? What is your favorite passage from the book of Numbers? Well, <coughs> let's see. There's a lot of actual, I was talking to Tommy about that before class, uh, that a lot of people skip the book of Numbers too, but he says there's a lot of history and numbers that people remember, and that's true. They heard about it in Bible class and heard about it from sermons. Uh, they know a lot about the book of Numbers that they don't actually know they know, because what happens is we, we read the book, or we come to the book of Leviticus, after reading Exodus, we come to the book of Leviticus and we think, Ugh. I like the stories that we found in the book of Exodus. So 
we just skip through or skip over Leviticus and we come to Numbers and we see that it starts out with a bunch of names. I think, well, I don't want to read a bunch, read a bunch of laws. I don't want to read a bunch of names, so I'll just skip on over to Deuteronomy. And there we find more narrative. Well, there's some narrative in Numbers too, but you don't see it in the first couple of chapters. So if you get bogged down in the first two, you'll skip over to Deuteronomy without ever finishing uh, the book. The book of Numbers is a, one of those books that's more uh, preached than it is read. People don't read it. Uh, they like Genesis because of the stories. They like Exodus because of the action, the stories. Leviticus, they it's a phone book. They don't want to read it. And Numbers starts out that way, so they just don't read it. But um, it's it's a it's a it's a very sad book in the Bible. Actually, we'll talk about why. Uh, that is. The book of Numbers in Hebrews, or in the Hebrew Bible, is called The Lord Said, because that's the first words of the book. They didn't call theirs thematically like we do, <clears throat> uh, but they, they call it by the first words of the book, and so it's called The Lord Said. Uh, in English, we call it Numbers because it contains two numberings of the people, two censuses, uh, one at the beginning and one at the end. The first census was a numbering of the Israelites who left Egypt, who were 20 years old and older, or at least older to the point that they could uh, were able to go to war. Uh, older, as far as 60 years old, probably didn't count those. Those were the grandfathers. 60 was at the brink of the um, age limit, not age limit, but... Um, span of a man's life at that time. Uh, people didn't live long like we do today, 80 and 90 uh, years. My dad's 84 and he still seems like he's got several years uh, in him. Uh, back then, 84 was a phenomenon. <laughs> Moses was that. He was 120 actually, but for the most part, uh, 60 was about as far as you went. At any rate, uh, of those who left Egypt that were 20 years older and able to go to war, there were 603,550 uh, people. The second numbering took place about 40 years later uh, before the people went into the land of Canaan. These would be actually be the children and the grandchildren of that first group who were numbered uh, at, the, at the beginning. In that second group, there was a 601,730, a difference of about 1,800, I'm not going to do the math, uh, about 1,800 uh, people. Now, that's odd. Why so similar, actually, a decrease in number? Probably you didn't think about it. Most folks don't, but... Um, the Israelites have been pretty uh, fertile, you might say, since the time of Abraham. We started out with two, two old people, 90 and 100 years old, and in 400 years, there are so many of them, the Pharaoh of Egypt said, we gotta kill these people because there are too many. And they come out of Egypt at 603,000. But over the next 40 years, they don't increase. They actually reduce in number by 1,800 people. What does that tell us? Well, God told them, if you follow me, I will bless you. Your cattle, your crops, your children. I will bless you with many children if you obey me. Well, they didn't. And so... He didn't. They weren't blessed with many children. They weren't being fruitful and multiplying in great numbers because God wasn't blessing them. And it not, wasn't because God had something against them. He just said, you don't obey me, I won't bless you. This is a teaching that he wanted to give them in this wilderness uh, period, uh, that, a teaching that should stay with them for the time, until the time that Christ comes, or even further than that. But throughout this time that they are God's people, Follow me, I will bless you. Don't follow me, I will curse you. And we find we'll see that more in the book of Deuteronomy 
uh, actually clearly uh, stated. But God says, I will bless you if you follow me. He didn't bless them. It's evidence that they were not faithfully following God. Wasn't there a, a different or an additional group of people counted in that second census? Uh, you know, I don't recall that. Uh, there were... I was thinking uh, there were some additional... In, in, there were um, people who came out of Egypt with Israel. And then I know it stated in the first... Uh, census do not count those who are not natural born Israelites and I don't recall to tell you the truth if that was stated in the second census it may be that it was not it seems like I was just recently reading something about that. I, I, I would have to check into that it's good good question to, to for me to look into because I didn't actually think about that I did see it in the first one but I didn't I, didn't, I don't like, remember it about the second it seemed like the group the groupings was was different for the second census than what the first it, it may have been I need to go back and look at that. Book of Numbers, as I said, is a sad book. It represents a, um, a tragedy in the Bible. Two-thirds of the book should never have been written. What uh, should have taken two weeks to get from Sinai to Canaan took 40 years. It was a short, comparably, when I say two weeks, it's actually an 11-day <laughs> journey by foot we're not talking about one person going by foot. We're talking about two million people. Uh, animals this, all the animals. So the, the 600,000 people that there were, you multiply that on American standards by 2.5, and you come up with 150 or a million point five uh, thereabouts. Uh, but it's not 2.5. You've got uh, multiple children uh, and Anyway, the estimates have been as much as uh, uh, two or three million people, but even at a conservative estimate, a uh, million point five, transporting them from one point A to point B, you don't get very far in a day because you have all their belongings, you have all the cattle, you have all the, everything else. But anyway, it took, it should have taken two weeks or thereabouts, give it a month at the most, uh, but it took them 40 years. The adult, captives who came out of Egypt were freed to go to Canaan except they ended up spending a lifeless life in the desert. And that's really the story of the book of Numbers. It's a book about how not to be the people of God. Turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul makes a statement here based upon the teaching of the book of Numbers. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that our fathers who were under the cloud all passed through the sea. All were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea. Who's he talking about? Israel who left Egypt. They ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual rock, but they drank of the spiritual rock that, they, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies are scattered in the wilderness. I think the King James, or one translation I read, says their carcasses are buried or scattered in the wilderness. Verse 6, now these things are become our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat, drink, and rose up to play. Now let us not, or not, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, as in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, let, now all these things happen to them as examples and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let he who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So here is a, you might say, a sermon from Paul to these Corinthian Christians that came straight out of the book of Numbers, uh, telling us what happened to those people and why. No wonder they didn't increase. Yeah, that's the reason they didn't increase. 
It's a book of failures, uh, a book uh, which we are to learn what not to do, or from which we need to learn what not to do. Again, like you mentioned in Romans chapter 15, it's a book that uh, is intended for our learning. Paul wrote to Timothy and he says, the scriptures, he's talking about the Old Testament scriptures were given, uh, you learned them making you wise into salvation. The book of Numbers is part of that. It would have been a fundamental part of it because it's part of the Pentateuch and the, the, the five books of Moses. And those were the, those five books were the basis, the foundation of everything else. If you don't have the five books of Moses, then everything else doesn't make sense. Joshua through Malachi doesn't make sense if you don't have the five uh, books of, of Moses. Even Moses makes uh, a significant mistake, uh, which cost him dearly. He did not get to go into the promised land. He saw it, but he didn't go into it. You know, Moses actually did finally make it to the promised land. It's recorded in the, I'm sorry? Were they buried in No, uh, God buried him and nobody knows where. Even the Bible, Jude says that uh, Michael, the archangel, and Satan uh, argued or fought about the burial place of Moses. So nobody knows where it is. God did it. But in the transfiguration of Jesus, who appeared to That's Jesus? Right. Moses and Elijah. Right. Exactly and that was on Mount Hermon, most likely, uh, which may actually be beyond the border of the land of Canaan, but I think it's considered part of the land of uh, Canaan. It's right. not an important thing at this point. <laughs> the book of Numbers, like the book of Exodus, is filled with both uh, legislative um, or laws, a list of laws, and also it has narrative. It speaks of God's laws uh, as given to them while they were camped. When God said, when the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire move, you move. The camp moved. But when it's stationary, you stay there. And when it was stationary, it seems that was the case that God gave them these laws. Whenever they camped, God gave them laws. That's the legislative part. And then when the camp moved with God, um, Moses kept a diary of those travels, uh, and the book of Numbers seems to be that diary, and it shows that, unfortunately, the very laws he gave them when they were camped, they broke when they were traveling. And that's kind of how the book goes. They give legislation, travel, legislation, travel, legislation, travel, legislation, give the law, break the law. Legislation, give the law, break the law. And that's how it sort of went. It breaks down into, uh, I think, five or six sections. Legislation, chapters 1 through 10, uh, for 19 days, God gave them laws. Chapters 10 through 12 is more narrative. The trip from Sinai to Kadesh Barnea took 11 days. Verses 13 through, chapters 13 through 20, more legislation while they're sitting there at Kadesh. Chapters 20 and 21. Now, we don't know how long they were at Kadesh, by the way. But chapters 20 and 21, the trip from Kadesh to Moab, which, again, a short journey took 38 years. And two chapters record those 38 years. Nothing important, nothing good happened in those 38 years. And then in chapters 22 through 36, more legislation where God spoke to them before they went into the land of Canaan. And those chapters essentially are the, the same time frame and, uh, as the book of De Deuteronomy that we'll talk about next week. To give you a little perspective of the book, Genesis covers about 4,000 years, Exodus covers about two, Leviticus covers one month, Numbers covers about 38 years, and Deuteronomy covers about five months. Something else interesting about the book, I thought anyway, is the phrase, God spoke to Moses face to face, or a, an equivalent thereof is found 80 times in the book of Numbers. What was that again? The book or the phrase, um, God spoke to Moses face to face, or something along that nature. Uh, it's, it's like they're eye to eye, or eye, you know, God spoke to Moses eye to eye or face to face. Uh, found 80 times in the book of Numbers. It's a very personal confrontation, you might say, between, Mo not confrontation, but relationship between uh, Moses and God. The laws were given in the book 
that were for the purpose of teaching them how to live in the presence of God. God says, I'm here with you. Face to face, he spoke with Moses. Moses was in the camp, uh, in the tabernacle, when I suppose, when he received these. It was during that time that we get the uh, picture found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I believe it is, where, and it's spoken of numbers, that when Moses left the tent, his face was glowing. And he would put a veil over his face. Uh, why? I used to think when I was a kid, or when I was younger, that he put the veil over his face so that people wouldn't see how bright his face was. But Paul says in the book of uh, First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, that he put the veil over the face because he didn't want them to see that the shining, the glory was fading. When you walk away from God, when you step outside the presence of God, he was in the presence of God, God speaking to him face to face. He then began to glow. He would go out and tell the people, and while he's talking to the people, his face would begin to not glow so much. So he put the veil on to show, uh, to, to just, to not... Uh, Vincent, you there? You yes, know? I'm still here. Okay, my connection went out for a minute. How much, did, where did I drop you? Um, you were talking about the veil over God's face. Okay, over Moses' face. Well, you didn't, you didn't lose Moses face. Good. <laughs> I just looked down and saw that uh, the connection was busted, uh, but your backs were good. All right, so uh, the veil, Paul made the point, and uh, I don't know if you caught this, but in the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul made the point that our ministry is better than that of Moses, because Moses was that of a fading glory. Ours is of an eternal glory. Uh, ours isn't fading. And but that, you know, we have to go to the book of 2 Corinthians to get all of that. But that comes from the book of uh, Numbers. And uh, that idea of his, his face glowing and him speaking with the people speaks of the fact that God is in their presence. In the book of Exodus, um, Moses spoke to God in the mountain or God spoke to Moses from the mountain. But in the book of Numbers, God is speaking to Moses in the camp. And it's important to understand, I think, that in the book of Numbers, God is in the camp with the people. He's among the people. And because he's among them, they need to know how to live in the presence of God. And that's the purpose of the legislation, the laws. Here's how you live. If God's in your presence, you need to live a different way. And here's how you do it. Here's what you got to do because God is in your presence. And they weren't so much moral laws or social laws like we might find in the book of uh, Exodus, for example, um, but laws given to prevent the people from what? <laughs> from losing their reverence for God. If. Um, There was a movie, what was it called? Years and years ago, back in the 70s, 60s maybe, uh, about a lion that had, is uh, people who lived in some safari type place and they kept lions and they became very, very familiar with the lions. And uh, is it Born to be Free or Born to be Wild? I know that's a song. Born Free, maybe. It's, what, it's a series, I think, if I recall correctly. But anyway, the, the keepers of the, the lions, I guess they were um, lions that had become injured or something, and they were repairing them and sending them back. They became very, very familiar with the lions. And if you became too familiar, too friendly with the lions, there was a danger that you would lose your respect for them and not really be as careful around them as you need to be. Well, these laws were to help them understand God is in your presence. But don't you become too familiar with God that you become careless. There's a way that you must live before uh, God. So it, it wasn't so much religious ritual, but it's a religious ritual mixed with their, with their daily lives. And you, you might find one law saying, uh, here's how you offer this sacrifice, or here's what you do in the tabernacle, and the next law tells you about how to take care of, of dung in the camp. 
uh, kind of all mixed up. And the point is, I think the way the author, and I think the author is God, Moses through God, uh, or God through Moses, uh, is telling us that there is no, should be no secular and sacred part of our lives. It's all sacred. Everything we do is done before God. Don't try to make secular and, and sacred. Don't say, you know, I'll give you my Sundays, but Monday's mine or Friday's mine. That's not the way God works. That's not the way Christianity uh, works. We need to stop dividing our lives into secular and religious. We do that in the church a lot. I say we, it's done in the church a lot, and it's a wrong thing to do. Uh, your money, it's not yours. It's God. What you give to God, I say, uh, people think, I give my tithe, that's what they call it sometimes, to God. That's his money. No, it's all his. All of it's his. And as a religious rite or religious service or an offering to God, we give back a portion to him to be used in this, in this ministry that he has given us. But the rest of it that stays in your pocket, it's still his. And you can't take it and it's use it in an ungodly way. You know, somebody says, well, I give my money to the church and I use the rest of it how I want to. No, you, you're a Christian. You use the rest of it how God wants you to. And we, I think we too easily divide life into secular. And, and we, we talk about our secular job. No such thing for Christian. It's not secular. If you're a bus driver, you're a bus driver for God. If you're a, whatever it is that you do, you, you do it to the glory of God. And we're, we're taught that in the, in, in the New Testament, but we seem to miss that, that, you know, uh, the preacher, well, he's got a, a that, that's his, uh, he doesn't have a secular job. He has a religious job. And, well, no. You know, if I ask a question, how many of you are uh, ministers for God? Everybody's hand goes up. Should anyway, but no, that's just the preacher. No, it's not. It's we're all God's ministers. We're all God's servants. Preachers serve in a, in a particular way. Elders serve in a particular way. The taxi driver serves in a particular way. It, it, there's no secular to it as a Christian. That's a worldly way of thinking. We are not of this world. We are just a passing through, the psalm says, and it quotes from book of uh, first Peter. Uh, you'll notice that several laws uh, were about how they worked to camp, the arrangement of the camp. Uh, there are lots and lots of details about that, who camps in front of the tabernacle, who camps beside the tabernacle, who camps behind the tabernacle. There were laws about how they were to dismantle the camp, who was to carry this, who was to carry that, how they were to carry this, or how they were to carry that. Uh, who goes in front of the tabernacle, or not the tabernacle, but the Ark of the Covenant, who goes beyond or behind the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, there's just all kinds of details about camping. And you wonder, you know, why does God care how they camp? Well, there's a couple of answers to that question. It was very organized, for one thing. Uh, when you're trying to get 2 million people through a wilderness for 40 years, you have to have organization or you have nothing but chaos. So in the way that God detailed it with these, this legislation in the first chapters, uh, it's very, very organized. But I think it's more to it uh, than that. I think um, these, these laws are telling us God is in your camp. God is a perfectionist. Be careful how you camp. Don't lose your reverence uh, for God. Uh, understand he's in your camp, and you need to be very uh, detail-oriented as, as, as God is. You don't earn your salvation. That's one thing the Pharisees came across with, with the laws from the Old Testament. If I do enough, I've earned my salvation, or earned my right to be with God. You don't earn it. Uh, it never was intended uh, that way, and it's not that way in the New Testament uh, either. It's just when God's in your presence, you need to live as if God is in your presence. And what a message that is to the New Testament Christian. He lives where? Within us. In us. We are the temple of God. How should you live because of that? Well, I give him my Sundays, but Monday's mine. Doesn't work. Not how it works. Can't work that way. Um, there are multiple laws about cleanness. Talks about sewage, it talks about garbage, uh, 
purification laws, cleanliness of the people, cleanliness of the camp. Um, again, there's a, an understanding here that uh, we're in the presence of God. And because we're in the presence of God, we can't be like Egypt. We can't be like Canaan. God's in our presence, and there's a certain way we need to live while he's in our presence or because he's in our presence. And that requires us to be different. Uh, we're going to be different than the world if we're living truly as if God is in our presence or in the New Testament terms, as if God is in our Bible, we're, or Bible in our bodies, we're going to be different from the world. Uh, we're going to absolutely di live differently because um, he's in our presence. We understand that. Hebrews chapter 12 says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. If we understand that our God is a consuming fire living in our presence, then we're not going to intentionally step across that line. Now, if God says do it this way, we're going to do it that way because God said it and he's in our presence. He is a consuming fire, not just in the Old Testament, but in the, in the New Testament, in this new kingdom, which cannot be shaken. He's still a consuming fire. So if I in the church today say, well, you know, the culture has changed since the first century and women were uh, not very well thought of in the first century. But nowadays, you know, there's an equality between men and women. So women should preach. Women should do this. Women should do this in the church. We, we don't have the right to change God's laws. Culture doesn't have the right or has the, any license to change God's laws. Women from New Testament teaching were not less. I mean, that's how the culture felt. But the New Testament teaching never uh, condoned uh, that, but still, nonetheless, when Paul spoke about the women's responsibility or role in the church, he didn't uh, come from the culture of the New Testament times. He went all the way back to creation and said, in the beginning, God created man first and then the woman. That's the order. I like the terminology in First Peter where it says that, and especially in the King James Version, where it we're a peculiar people. We are a peculiar people. We're a different people. And that's not just Old Testament, that's New Testament. We're, we're different. The narrative sections in Numbers uh, take us from uh, the legislative of what they should do and shows us what they actually did. And it's not a pretty picture. Uh, that's unfortunate, but it's, it's a sad, sordid story throughout the book of Numbers. The wilderness becomes their testing ground and it was a testing ground in which they failed miserably. And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, their carcasses are scattered throughout the uh, wilderness because of it. It was a time between their salvation from Egypt and their entering into the promised land. It was a trial period. Does that sound familiar to you? We've been saved by God. We're going to the promised land. We're now in a trial period. How are you doing with that? We've got the legislation of what God said we must do. God's in our presence. How are we living in the presence of God during this trial period? Is Are our bodies scattered spiritually throughout the desert? Or are we, like Joshua and Caleb, remaining faithful and entering into the promised uh, land? There are several sections that speak of the strengths and the failures of the leaders of Israel. We'll see that in Moses. We'll see his strengths. We'll see his weaknesses. You'll see that in Aaron, his strength and his weaknesses. Strengths strengths and his weaknesses. You'll see that in Miriam, one of the leaders of Israel, and she was uh, Moses and Aaron's sister. She was a prophetess. Uh, we'll see her strengths and weaknesses. She was stricken with leprosy because of uh, a sin that she committed. Uh, there's Korah, uh, even though he met with an, a bad end, you know, he was a among leadership, he just didn't have the leadership uh, position that he wanted. He wanted a higher position than what he was given. He was jealous of Moses and ended up dying because of his usurpation of the authority of uh, Aaron in that case. We'll read about a fellow named uh, Balaam. He's not a Jew. He was a prophet. Turned out to be a uh, false prophet, but he did, and I don't know if we'll have time to go into that story, he did actually end up giving a prophecy uh, from God about Jesus. 
Um, not only were there accounts of individual um, failures and strengths, but there were the accounts in the book of Numbers of the people in general, their failures and strengths. And one of the greatest sins, I use the term great as in amount or big, not in this, it was a good thing. Biggest sins, and hear this New Testament Christians, one of the biggest sins of the children of Israel in the wilderness for which their bodies were scattered throughout the wilderness was grumbling in their tents. God heard their grumbling. He heard their cry in the book of Exodus and he saved them. He heard their grumbling in the book of uh, Numbers and he cursed them. We need to be careful about grumbling. When we go home and have roast preacher or roast elders for lunch, I don't like the way they did that or I don't like the way they did that or I don't like what God's doing in my life. We grumble in our tents. Guess what? God hears it. Our tent is our life. God is in that tent. He hears our grumblings. If that's what we do, we need to develop a new attitude. If we are placing ourselves upon the altar of God and being renewed by the power by, by the power of God in our mind and in our heart, then we're going to get past that grumbling. If we're still grumbling after 10 or 20 or 30 years being in Christ, then we're not placing ourselves upon that altar. We're not allowing God the access to our heart and to our mind to be changed. Christians, those of you who are going to be preachers, you need to look at this because this is powerful teaching that you need to tell your congregations. Christians, stop grumbling. You might recall that it was because of their grumblings in the book of Numbers in their tents that God sent the fiery serpents among them. Remember that story? Fiery serpents? Snakes came out, they were uh, in number into the camp of the people of Israel. They were biting them, they were dying. And the people began saying they're sorry, they began asking for forgiveness, but God didn't take away the snakes. What he did was said, Moses, take a brazen snake, a snake made out of brass or copper, put it up on a pole, lift it up, and when somebody is bitten by a snake, they got two options. They can look to the snake and be saved, or they can say, that ain't gonna work. And we continue their grumbling, then they're going to die. Uh, it would be a fool who recognized that when people were looking to the snake, they were being saved, and then not look to the snake. Recall where that passage is quoted or referred to in the book of the New Testament. In John chapter 3, verse 16, we all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that it uh, whichever believed in him should not perish. You know, verse 15, God, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus in that passage, in the whole passage. He says, Nicodemus, you remember, right, the story in Numbers about the snake on the pole. That if they looked to, if they believed me and looked to the snake, they'd be saved. Well, I'm going to lift up my son, and the people who look to him will be saved. And that's the idea behind the passage that it comes from. The idea, but the theology has its conception, you might say, or uh, seed in the book of uh, Numbers. Besides the grumbling, there, there was a second great big failure of the Jews that happened in Kadesh Barnea or Kadesh. It too was a lack of belief or lack of trust in, in God. And we'll talk about it uh, if time allows. I've got 15 minutes to do about an hour's worth of lecture. Um, the, the 12 spies who went in and the crowd believed the two spies rather than, or believed the 10 spies rather than the faithful two. 
their belief was in the word of the spies rather than what God said. I want to talk about that. The account of Balaam, a prophet from Syria who tried who was who tried to curse God's people, but every time he tried to curse God's people, when he spoke a curse or tried to speak a curse, God would cause a blessing to come out. And uh, he was doing it for money because the people of or the king of Moab, I think it was, Moab or Edom, I forget which, you can correct me, um, said, we don't want these people in our land. They, they look out and they see the Israelites coming. They're going to go through their land. We don't want them in our land. They'll eat up our food. They'll eat up our cows. They'll, they'll take over our, our property. So they hired a soothsayer from the north to come and curse the people. And the soothsayer said, okay, I'll do it for, you know, you give me some money, I'll do it. Um, paraphrasing and condensing. And finally, he, he did come and he stood afar off and tried to curse the people, a blessing come out. King of Edom or Moab, whichever it was, got mad and says, well, I hired you to curse, not to bless. Well, I guess I need to get a little closer. So he got a little closer and he, he, he spoke a curse or tried to speak a curse and it turned into a blessing. God calls him. The king says, well, you're just trying to drive up the price. And no, I'm not. God's doing this, but I do need some more money. <laughs> And so he got a little closer, closer, and that's when the Balaam's donkey says, uh, spoke to him and says, you know, God's trying to tell you something, and you're not getting it. Uh, that's not the exact way it worked. But anyway, uh, he pronounced another blessing when trying to pronounce a curse, and finally the king of Edom gave up on it. And, uh, that's when Balaam made his prophecy about uh, the coming uh, Messiah in a few thousand years. And then when we get to the book of uh, Daniel, uh, and well, we'll talk about that later, uh, several weeks later. Let me see if I can go through the book of Numbers very quickly, uh, making a, a few points. I'm down to 10 minutes to do what I wanted to do in a whole hour. J.B. Phillips wrote a book entitled, Your God is Too Small. And it's based upon teaching from the book of Moses, or book of Numbers, that these people's God was too small. It's not that he was too small, but in their mind, their God was too small. When we, when our notions or ideas or concepts of God are inaccurate, then our attitude or our behavior toward him will also be flawed. And that's what happened to the people of Israel. He lived in their camp with them, and their, rather than appreciating him for who he was and what he's done, they, they developed false concepts or wrong concepts about God, and therefore their behavior before God became flawed. If I see God, for example, as a benevolent grandfather, oh, he's just such a nice guy. He's such a teddy bear. I'll take his, begin to take his mercy for granted, and I'll overlook his judgment. But his judgment is there. We can't take one without the other. If I think of God as a stern, harsh disciplinarian, I might overemphasize the wrath of God, the punishment of God, and forget about his grace. So we need to in our minds and our hearts, develop an accurate picture of God so that our behavior toward God will be proper. And that's what happens or what needed to happen in the book of Numbers. Uh, J.B. Phillips wrote in his book that man's tendency to make God into a bigger version of himself is a problem. We try to recreate God in our image rather than God creating us in his image. We make him think like us, and react like us, and feel like us. And because of that, we develop a yardstick by which we measure God rather than taking the, the measurements that he has given us. And the character of God changes because we have wrong concepts about God. Uh, our worship of this kind of God that we have developed in our own image, or according to our own standards rather than by his standards, begins to become a worship of self. You think about the big mega churches today who have all these concerts in the name of God, where they're really, it's entertainment uh, taking place. And uh, while there are worshipful things done, it's done for the purpose of entertaining the masses of crowds who come so that they'll come again 
uh, next week. That's probably being pretty harsh in judgment of I got about those folks, but they are actually not offering God what he wants. They're offering God what they like. That's what Cain did. That's what was the impetus behind the first uh, murder, that Abel offered God what God wanted. Cain offered God what Cain liked, and it caused a, a problem. If God in our minds is just a bigger version of ourselves, we're going to offer God what we like, what we think he would want rather than what he's actually said. Francis Chan said someone came up to him one Sunday and said, I didn't get much out of worship today. And Chan, I think, appropriately replied to him and said, well, it's a good thing we weren't worshiping you then, huh? <laughs> Worship concerts, worship centered around the clock, worship uh, through rituals that we have no idea of what we're doing, we're just doing it. None of this is what God wants in worship and we need not try to put upon God what God has not uh, said or stated or put upon himself. The Bible is clear in its assessment of God. He is not a deluxe version of ourselves. He is very distinct, he is very different. We get this from the book of Leviticus if we don't get anything else. Out of the book of Leviticus, we get that. But it's here in Numbers as well. The God of Abraham cannot be stuffed into a, a uh, practical size box that keeps him comfortably at our, our convenience. Our God is bigger than that. And these Israelites who are fresh out of Egypt and full of pagan ideas, they, they had a problem with uh, this kind of God because it wasn't what they were accustomed to. And I think, you know, when they offered that or made that... Uh, bull out of gold, and Aaron made that bull out of gold, and they worshiped it. They were trying to make God in their image, or according to the image that they were comfortable with or accustomed to. And God says, I'm not like that. And don't make me like that. In fact, just after that, he told them that uh, don't make <laughs> carved images after uh, and call it uh, by who I am. Uh, God must be treated with respect for who he is. And that's a theme that we find throughout the book of Numbers. He's teaching him them, they didn't get it, but he's teaching them to respect him, to reverence him. I'm not a God of convenience. I'm a God of power. I'm a God of authority. You do what I say, even if you don't understand uh, why. In Numbers uh, 13, the children of Israel have come to the wilderness of Paran. Two years have passed since they crossed the Red Sea and have escaped Egypt. They've come now to the border of the promised land and God has made several promises about this promised land. It's a beautiful, going to be a beautiful land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's a good and spacious land. I'm going to give it to the descendants of Abraham. That's who you are. It's yours. It's a gift from God. In verses uh, one and two, we find them choosing or commissioning 12 men, they're called spies. What is the purpose of commissioning these spies going into the land? Well, when we think of the word spy, we think of covertly going around and, and spying out uh, the land. And it, it can have that meaning in a, in a military sense, but I think God having them choose spies, he's just, the word actually means to go and wander about, meander about. Go into the land, you 12, meander about, see what you see, and then come back and report it to the people. It's not a military mission, uh, though it could have that meaning, it could have some of that uh, involved in it, but just go see the land that I promised you. It is, see that it's what I said, a, a beautiful land, a, a land flowing with milk and honey. You can go in there and not have to build houses because the houses are already built. You don't have to plant farms. The farms are already planted. It's, it, it's yours. When they first went in, they were supposed to give God the first year's crops because God said, I gave it to you as a gift. You give it back. But uh, anyway, that's for the book of Joshua, not for the book of <laughs> Numbers. Uh, the Lord spoke to Moses, chapter three, 13, verse 1, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of, the fathers, uh, tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, every one is chief everyone, a chief among them. So it was never God's intent that the spies determined if they could take the land. It was God's intent from the message of the spies to show them, 
this is what I said. It is a good land. And they did find uh, that out. They were to go there and measure the cities and the people and so that Israel might see uh, what wonderful gift God is giving them because they're on the verge of going in. If they had done what God said at this point, they're two months uh, past Sinai, they, they are able to walk right into Canaan. Just trust me and go in. So their job, the spies' job, was just to confirm all that God has said to encourage the people, I suppose. Uh, the spies were gone 40 days. They came back with this report. Man, the land is beautiful, just like God said. And it's a land flowing with milk and honey, just like what God uh, said. Look at verse 27. Then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. They had a big bunch of grapes. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Verse 31, but the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against this people for they are stronger than uh, we are. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it were of great stature. That's not true. They said back in verse uh, 28 that they saw the sons of Anak. They were the giants, but now they've changed their story because they're trying to, I don't know what they're trying to do. Uh, they're afraid, and they say, all of the people that we saw are of great uh, stature. There we saw giants. The sons of Anak came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so were we in their sight. So, you know, the Israelites, you look at them as a, in, in a um, stereotypical sense, maybe that's not the right word, but as a group, they're not big people. You, go, you can find in nations uh, that there are people who are, are just really, really big, big people by descent. And Jews, typically speaking, are not. So it would not be hard to find uh, people who were larger than the Jewish people. But here, they're, uh, they, I think they emphasized it too much. But they had a defeatist attitude. Yeah, they, they did. They, they had a... The point is, I guess, they had an attitude of distrust. You know, they were right. They could not take the land. But God wasn't asking them. He says, he was gonna give I'll give you the land. I'm going with you. I'm not sending you. I'm going with you. And 40 years later, uh, that was evidenced. You know, God was would did 40 years later what he would have done for them. But they came back with this report, and the people believed it. And so they had a distrust in God. God had just split the Red Sea. They, they witnessed that. These are the same people who witnessed the splitting of the Red Sea. These are the same people who witnessed the plagues that destroyed all the Egyptian gods. These are the same people that wa watched God drown the greatest standing army of the time. He, they saw him give, him, give them uh, uh, bread every morning or every day, manna. They saw them uh, watch God give them the quail. They saw the water from the rock. These people had witnessed the power of God, and then they said, well, it's not great enough to go in and face those giants. Well, Shame on them. But I think we Christians sometimes do it too. My sins are too big. The world against us is too much. Uh, God can't fix all of that. And we can't enter the land if that's our, in your words, defeatist uh, attitude. Well, our time is up. I, want, I had some more I wanted to say about the book of uh, Numbers. Um, recall, remember what Joshua and Caleb said to these people who says we cannot take the land. In chapter 14, he says, the Lord will bring us into the land and give it to us. Do not rebel. Do not fear the people. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. I think Joshua and Caleb are saying, you're right. We can't take it. But guess what? God is with us. Do not fear them. Understand that God 
is with us. And that's a powerful teaching from the book of Numbers, but that's all we can deal with. I'll try to, if I can uh, make time for it in next week's uh, study on Deuteronomy and, and Joshua, I'll try to finish this. I don't know if I'll do that or not, but I hope you have a better idea and concept of the book of uh, Numbers and Leviticus after our lessons tonight. And I will see you next week. God bless. Good night. Have a good night. You too, Vincent. All right. Well, in fact, Numbers was on our next week lesson anyway, so. Next week is supposed to be Numbers? Numbers of Deuteronomy. I'm supposed to do Leviticus all night tonight? Just tonight, Leviticus. Well, I cheated there, didn't I? That's all right. <laughs>